Hey guys, it's Danny. Today the ladies are taking a little bath, a bit of a siesta time. And while they're at it, I thought we could repot some Phalaenopsis orchids. I have five new fowls that I just ordered, plus one that I found locally, which I believe is quite special. So I'm going to take you along as I repot them. Usually fowls are pretty easy in comparison to other orchids to repot, but you never know what surprises you can find. And I'm sure there are many things that we could talk about and hopefully I could give you some tips that if you're a beginner, maybe you didn't know. So that's it. Let's get to work. So the first thing we do, just like with any other repotting, is to make sure that the orchids are wet. It is much, much easier to remove orchids from their old medium or actually the pieces of medium from their roots if the roots are wet, they're soaked and properly saturated. And especially with sphagnum moss, it is really important because it's almost impossible to remove dry sphagnum moss from roots, especially if it's compacted like this and this, it's solid as a rock. And if we try to remove it dry, we will most certainly damage the root system. So being that most of the orchids that I acquired are potted in sphagnum moss and they're quite compacted, I will go ahead and soak all of my orchids, including the one that I have in bark and make sure that the roots are properly hydrated. P.S. If you missed my unboxing haul, check it down below in the description or in an info card somewhere on the screen. Now you will notice that some of my orchids are in bloom and generally speaking, it's not a super great idea to repot orchids while they are in bloom if you want to enjoy the blooms because there is a chance that some of the flowers or the buds will fall due to the stress of repotting. However, with Phalaenopsis orchids, it is rarely the case. It happens as well, but I find that it generally is more likely when the orchid is already suffering. My orchids appear to be very healthy. They have a very good root system. And furthermore, they have very robust roots. So damaging the root system while repotting is minimal with Phalaenopsis orchids. And if that wasn't enough, my fells are potted in sphagnum moss, which is really, really easy to remove. And I'm pretty sure that I will manage to repot all of my orchids without actually damaging the roots quite at all. So this was a general explanation, but furthermore, these are, I believe, sequential bloomers. I suspect many of these orchids will actually continue to rebloom from the very same flower spike for years and years. So if I try to wait while they don't have blooms, I might look at a few months ahead from now on. And that's not ideal, being that they are potted in such compacted sphagnum moss. And you'll probably see why as I unpot them. There is a chance that deep down in the core of the root bowl, the moss will simply not get wet no matter how much I soak it. This happens a lot when the moss is just so compacted. Also, I don't want the new roots to continue growing in this medium and in this pot. I want them to extend in a brand new pot with fresh new medium. In any case, I am personally more keen in repotting the orchid in fresh new medium than enjoying the blooms right now. I can wait until they rebloom. So with that said, it is time to repot. There's no point in actually pressing on the pot like I usually do because this is a very flimsy pot. Look at that, it's so flexible. And the medium inside is so hard, well, kind of loosened up a little bit with the water, but it's so compacted that I'm actually not gonna achieve anything. What I will do is try to push from the bottom a little bit. And you can see that the orchid is starting to come out of the pot. And then I will grab the orchid from the axis as close to the roots as possible and pull up. And there we have it. The orchid is unpotted. Now it is time to remove the moss. So I will not bore you with this process. I will take my time and remove this sphagnum moss. I might use a pair of tweezers if I want to get into all the nooks and crannies. We'll see if it's actually needed, but I'm pretty sure that I will have something to show you as I get towards the core of the root system. So let's speed up the process. Okay, so I'm halfway there, but I can notice that this orchid has been up potted, meaning 
the original medium, the older medium, wasn't removed when the pot was changed. So at some point it was potted in a much tinier pot and then it got repotted or up-potted into this pot. The original medium was not removed, but new mix was added and we can tell by the shape of the roots, you can see they form a sort of a wall towards the center here, that this was the case. Now, this is a sort of okay and not okay technique. If you're a home grower, I don't suggest you up pot like that. I would get rid of the old medium and offer a fresh new medium because you don't really know how fast that old medium will degrade. If you're a nursery though, this technique is okay because it leads to potential less setback for the orchid. And maybe Phalaenopsis are not the best example, but when it comes to Oncidiums and maybe even Miltoniopsis, which are far more finicky, this makes sure that the orchid is not set back, it grows to its full potential before it gets sold and actually spends less time in the nursery and less resources and that will impact the price. Now, it's a longer discussion than that, but for a nursery, this is a typical technique and many of the times it's okay, as long as it's not postponed way too much. With some orchids on the market, you will discover that the interior root ball is already gone because of this suffocation practically, with some, not so much. Phalaenopsis, luckily for us, are very, very tough little orchids and they have very thick roots. They usually find a way and typically we don't have very bad surprises with them. But it's not a rule and obviously you can find Phalaenopsis with quite a damaged root system. It has to do with the practices of the nursery as well. If the nursery doesn't wait for the entire medium to completely dry out and keeps watering it while the medium is soggy, then yes, chances of a bad root system will be much more likely. If the nursery doesn't do this, obviously, you can have a very, very compacted little orchid up potted even with a very old medium in the center in perfect shape. Okay, so I'll go ahead and remove all of this. I will get my tweezers right now because my fingers are a little bit too large and I really, really don't wanna mess up the root system. And I'll come back when I'm done. Five minutes later and I'm done. A few words about the tweezers. If you have that type of tweezers that you usually use with eyebrows, that's not a very good tool. I would recommend you go for something like this. It can even have a straight nose, but these tweezers, which are usually used by electricians, are the best in my opinion to remove that stubborn sphagnum moss or whatever medium you have stuck in the root ball. And would you look at that? I have absolutely no dead root. How is that even possible? As I was saying, it's about the practices, about what type of worker you're working with, the nursery, and so on and so forth. The medium that I will be using is a mixture of sphagnum moss and bark, which is my default mixture for all of my orchids. Almost no exception. What differs sometimes is the ratio between moss and bark. Of course, for those orchids who want more moisture, I will just add more moss. For Phalaenopsis, it's not really the case. They're not very, very thirsty orchids. And they're very drought tolerant. And with this, I'm ready to repot. A little side note, I'm not using hydrogen peroxide 3% on the roots of my Phalaenopsis. I think it's absolutely not necessary. In all of these about seven years, I have not seen one single snail on Phalaenopsis, not even when I had that big outbreak in my collection and I used to share water. No, there was never any snail, never any bites, never any issues with Phalaenopsis orchids. I'm referring to the tiny bush snails, not the big garden snails or the slugs that don't have a shell. Those are a different story but these orchids do not have slugs. I would have seen it. The bush snails are the ones that are harder to spot. So I have not used hydrogen peroxide on Phalaenopsis for six years or something like that. Never had any issues. Until I have issues, I'm not gonna waste the hydrogen peroxide on them. I suspect they just don't like the roots. Maybe they don't taste good. Maybe they're too thick, too robust for them to munch on. I don't know what the explanation is. Never, ever, ever seen a bush snail munching on a Phalaenopsis. And until I do, I will save up on my hydrogen peroxide because big quantities are scarce in my area. So I will use a typical 13 centimeter pot. I think this is about five inches. And I will use it even though it is quite a lot larger than the root system because Phalaenopsis are big root producers. Even the mini Phalaenopsis, the tiniest ones, they produce a lot of roots. Roots are very, very thick. And if I would use a smaller pot, let's say something like this, which 
If you are to go with what the articles say looks more fitting, you would not have a good time in about six months because the roots will absorb way too much water way too fast and you'll be obligated to water more frequent and it will mess up all your schedule if you're on a tight schedule as it is. And if you're just a little careful to make the medium airy, you don't need small pots. You can go ahead and use much bigger pots than let's say what you'd expect. Alrighty, so as always, I am starting with a layer of sphagnum moss on the bottom. There is a very good reason for this. It has to do with the way that I water my orchids and you can see my technique and all of the explanation in an info card or down below in the description. And I also typically like to mix my medium as I go. I don't make a separate mixture. I'm a little clumsy because there's a camera in my way. But also when I control the layers in such a way, I can make sure that the layers of moss actually communicate with each other. And here we go, my orchid is done. The top layer will always be bark because it does not attract algae. If I would leave the sphagnum moss on top, I would have so much algae in about a month, it would not be funny anymore. So all that's left to do is to water this orchid. I always water my orchids after I repot them, never do I let them dry, particularly orchids which have been dry for so long. And with that said, one orchid is done. This was the Bashi Red Sun. Let's move on to the next one. Now here we have a smaller Phalaenopsis and I actually prepared this pot for it. We'll see if this is the right call because there are instances in which you will have orchids which will not take over the pot all that fast. And typically these are the seedlings. Once an orchid is mature, it will produce roots much faster and more roots compared to a seedling. And I do suspect this is a bit of a seedling so I can get away with the tinier pot and save some space in the meantime. Okay, this was much, much faster to unpot since we didn't have so many roots and the medium was not so compacted. And let's see. Yep, I do believe she will be perfect for this pot. And I suspect I will have about two years until I need to repot again, which is great. And here we have her, our second orchid is done. At this point, you might ask yourselves, but Danny, if you're gonna repot an orchid from pure sphagnum moss to a combination of bark and moss, won't the roots have issues adapting? And the answer is no, because I took into account the fact that they are used to quite a lot of moisture. When a root adapts to a certain environment, it doesn't necessarily adapt to the type of medium it is in. It has no idea it is potted in charcoal or lecca or moss or bark. It can only detect the properties of that medium, moisture, air, and how safe it is for the roots to grow on that surface. So in order not to shock the roots with this repotting, all I need to do is make sure that the levels of moisture and air are not necessarily super similar, but kind of close. I do want to provide more aeration, but I do want to maintain the level of moisture. And I can do so by not letting this medium stay super bone dry for too long. And if you're wondering if this won't be a little too much work for me, no, not necessarily, because I actually up potted. And what I mean by that is I used bigger pots and bigger pots do tend to stay more moist than smaller pots. Obviously, we don't have the same medium. But I do believe that between my way of watering and the size of the pot, I will get similar conditions to the previous pot and medium. So I'm actually not very worried about the roots not getting adapted. But we'll see about that in a future update, so make sure you're subscribed. So this was the Phalaenopsis Palace Reef. Let's move on. Now here we have an orchid which I just have to lean against that crate over there because it has pretty long flower spikes. Out of all the Phalaenopsis I received, this one is actually showing signs of dehydration. And this is because it's a bigger orchid and it has flowers. Usually orchids which have flowers demand a little bit more water than usual and you can see 
by how limpy the leaves are that this orchid could use more water. Now, this is not an issue and actually, when you're receiving new orchids, this is ideal. It's far worse to receive orchids that are super wet. I'll try to find an unboxing for you guys so you can see how much issues I had with orchids which were packed wet. Some of them were unsavable in the end, so I much more prefer dealing with a little bit of dehydration. You can see it's not extreme, we don't actually have wrinkles, we just have a little bit of floppiness. So I would much more rather tackle this than all sorts of rotting and mold issues caused by too much moisture. Now, even if this orchid is slightly dehydrated, I will still repot it. And this is because I am not going to damage the root system, which is quite extensive by the looks of it. So I'm 100% sure that the orchid will continue to hydrate itself even if I repot it, because it will remain with 100% of its roots. orchid down three more to go i think the next two are pretty similar cases if i find something interesting i will show you but i'll skip them i'll show i'll show them to you repotted at the end let's take a look at the special one because it's quite interesting here she is this is a no id phalaenopsis that i found locally and i really really liked it because it's one of those big lip phalaenopsis i also have never seen this color and pattern before and to me, it just looks very interesting. There is a big problem with this orchid though, and this is it has a terminal flower spike. So in the springtime, we will try to induce a cakey. Normally, these orchids will be prone to producing some cakeys, but there are some rare instances in which they will not. Since they are such complex hybrids, you don't know what they're gonna do. So whatever instincts, quotation marks, they might have from their ancestors, might simply just not work properly due to the complexity of their genes. But we'll deal with that in the springtime. Right now, she is more interested in producing more and more flowers from these flower spikes. And I am decided to enjoy the blooms just in case we don't manage to obtain any type of cakey from this orchid. But it is time to repot it because I did not repot it ever since I purchased it and this medium looks awful just awful now this is not sphagnum moss it is bark and yes even bark can become suffocating if it's very old and it degrades it starts to become mushy and crumbly so what started out as a very airy and non-water retentive medium suddenly with age becomes a very very water retentive and suffocating medium so it's time for this orchid to come out of this medium and let's hope that there aren't many big pieces that I will have to detach from the roots because bark is actually much harder to remove from the root system than sphagnum moss. Oh yeah, this medium is very degraded and smells awful. Joey agrees. In this instance, we can see that the plug is actually a little basket and inside this is not sphagnum moss, nor is it dirt, it is cocoa peat. It is a coconut-based medium, which is much more airy than soil itself, doesn't compact as much, but it's pretty fine. And of course, if left in the middle, it can actually spoil the roots. Furthermore, this little basket didn't really help the roots spread as much as they wanted, so I will just remove it. In this case, we can see that the root system really isn't in such good shape as in the previous cases, and I believe there are two reasons for that. One would be the practices of the nursery, and second would be the material itself. Even if sphagnum moss can compress, I still don't believe it's as suffocating as this cocoa peat. Generally speaking, I don't like to use cocoa peat because it's so fine that it blocks all air pockets. Sphagnum moss has a shape to it, it's not a powder. So even if it compresses, it still maintains this shape, this freely shape. Imagine if this was dust, because at the end of the day, that's what that cocoa powder is. It's not as fine, but it clogs up all of the air pockets much better than sphagnum moss. So this is the result. You can see these roots don't really look so well, but they're not gone. And considering this orchid does not have a lot of good roots, I will let them be. They might not last, but right now, this orchid needs them. 
In this case, I actually rinsed the root system at the sink because whatever media I had left was just so fine and so powdery that I didn't want it in the new pot. And there we go, my orchid is repotted. I opted to change those flower stakes. If you notice, they were a little bit moldy. That tells me this orchid was exposed to a lot of moisture and not so much ventilation. Maybe that's why the medium was so, so bad. I replaced them with these repot me stakes that they sent me for free quite a long time ago for a video. And I ended up really liking this type of stake that has a little hook here at the top. I'll link them to you down below if you're interested in them, or at least to check out how the shape is. These don't mold because they're coated wire, they're not bamboo or wood, so they seem to be pretty long lasting. Now a few more words on that medium. I am sure that if you really want to make a cocoa peat work, you could, but I strongly advise against using it as it is, particularly in pretty big pots because at the end of the day, it's very, very powdery. It will completely clog up all of the air pockets. So if you have it at your disposal and you wanna try it out, I do suggest you mix it with bark or something else that will retain some air pockets. I don't believe it is as safe and as good as sphagnum moss, not by a long shot, but it seems to become a very, very popular medium for terrestrial plants generally. So you might actually be able to find it in your area more than sphagnum moss. If you do, Keep that in mind, just mix it with something else and make sure you provide some air pockets because it's so fine for orchids, way too fine for epiphytics with thick roots. And here are all of my orchids repotted. Before we end the video, let me just remind you my three golden rules that any medium that you might want to use with your orchids should follow. Number one, it has to allow for watering. Number two, it has to provide air at the same time. And number three, it has to be safe chemically and physically. In the chemical sense, it should not leach all sorts of stuff that affect roots, nor should it alter parameters in such way that the environment stops being favorable for orchids, for example, pH or hardness. And physically wise, it should not be harmful for roots. It should not be sharp or scratchy in any way. Well, if we take a look at my little orchids here, let's see if all of these rules are met. Number one, yes, it does allow for moisture. We can see the medium is wet and the roots are wet. Number two, does it allow for air? Absolutely. Can we see how big this air pocket is? That's perfectly fine. Air is crucial for epiphytic orchids. And if we look through the pot, we can see that, yes, we have medium, but also quite a few air pockets. And number three, well, we all know that bark and sphagnum moss generally are completely safe for orchids. It boils down to the brand, of course, but my experience with these products says that they are absolutely suited for orchids since I never had issues with them. So theoretically, this mixture should absolutely work for orchids, but it doesn't really mean that it will work for everybody. Because beyond these simplified rules that I came up with, there's also user error and also incompatibility with your lifestyle and environment. For now though, I do think my little orchids will be just fine, but of course I will keep you guys up to date. Thank you so much for joining me. Hope you had a great time with me and I hope you have some great holidays if you're celebrating. You know the drill, like or dislike this video below, subscribe to my channel for regular orchid videos, tutorials, experiments, and other fun orchid subjects. And if you wish to support the channel and the ladies mansion, then do consider visiting the merch store down below. And with that said, I'll see you guys next time. Bye.